with an iPhone, please take it out for a moment if you don't mind. I'm asking you to do something that will show your colleagues around you what we need to be concerned about. If you'll go on your iPhone to settings and give me a nod of your head when you've got there. Settings. Okay. Now click on settings and then down toward the very bottom is the word general for the first screen. Get to general. Okay. General. Now go to the top to the word about. Now after you click on about, you have to go all the way down to the bottom to something you would not normally see called legal. And then when you click on legal, at the bottom of that, you click on RF exposure. Right? RF exposure. Could I ask you to read the paragraph above the hyperlink there? To reduce exposure to RF energy, use a hands-free option, such as the built-in speakerphone, the supplied headphones, or other similar accessories. Carry iPhone at least five millimeters away from your body to ensure exposure levels remain at or below the as-tested levels. Cases with metal parts may change the RF performance. Thank you very much. Okay, so in fact, five millimeters, in my opinion, is not quite enough, but it does mean that you stay at the as-tested levels. And the question is, how many of you who looked at this on your phone now knew it was there? Okay, one. So the advice I would give all of you at this point is please put your phones on airplane mode. You'll save your battery and you'll save yourself from exposure to do so. But also, please share this information with anyone who you're concerned about. And all, in addition, understand this is the only part of the phone that you cannot um, easily copy. You know how you can copy things and send them around? This is not easy to copy. You can take a screenshot of it to share it, and I would urge you to do so. We are launching a website called showthefineprint.org, and that website will provide you with all the fine print warnings that are currently buried inside your smartphones, your iPads, your iPhones, and other devices. They all come with various warnings people are not aware of. Now, the city of Berkeley, just last month, passed the right to know legislation. A number of scientists and community activists worked on this for more than five years. I was one of them, along with Professor Joel Moskowitz, and more recently, Professor Lawrence Lessig of Harvard Law School. Now, Professor Lessig may be known to you. He's a distinguished First Amendment expert. He has offered to defend any city, pro bono, that passes the right to know about cell phone safety. And the city of Berkeley unanimously passed this last month. We think the city of Framingham can do so as well. And we are working with cities around the country who are very interested in passing this same ordinance because the cell phone industry is going to challenge it as a violation of their First Amendment rights. They are going to argue, just as the tobacco industry has argued, that it is compelled speech to require them to tell you in advance of, of purchasing a phone the same information that they believe they can legally bury inside the phone. They say it's a violation of their First Amendment rights to compel them to tell you what's buried inside the phone. I think that's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Now, as we have our conversation tonight, we're going to hear from a distinguished panel and I'm going to call on Dr. Katherine Steiner Adair to talk with you about her observations. She's a clinical psychologist with years of experience working with children and their families. She's the author of a very fascinating book, The Big Disconnect, which documents 
the ways that digital technology is undermining parenting of young children and indeed undermining the lives of school children today. Without further ado, I will ask her to come and talk with you now. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Hello. Uh, um, let me actually begin by doing a teeny bit of research with those of us who are here in this room. How many of you have the experience or have had the experience of hearing somebody else's cell phone go off? And even though it's not your phone or your ringtone, you reach for your phone. Hands. Yeah, the research would say 80% of that. And how many of you have had the experience of your phone hasn't gone off for a while and suddenly you think you hear it ringing or pinging or vibrating, but in fact, it is not? Yeah. Okay, uh, also about 80%. This is one of my favorite questions to ask grown-ups. They're not often as honest as children are. How many of you take your cell phones with you to the bathroom? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We have become so psychologically dependent on our phones as adults that they function in our lives just like little blankies do for our toddlers. We have separation anxiety without them. We do not need them to pee. But yet we feel better when we have them with us. These are signs of psychological dependency. It is not the same thing as being addicted. And we know that some people are in fact truly addicted to their smartphones, their cell phones. But it is also a very different issue when we talk about adults who are fully grown, whose brains are fully developed, still changing, still plastic, still fluid, still very much influenced actually by the amount of time you spend on a screen. But it is very different when we talk about, as all adults often do, using the language of addiction to describe their phones. I'm addicted to this thing. Oh, I need an email fix. I'm having withdrawal. Hold on, I just have to check and see who called me. Language I heard often when I interviewed 1,000 adults. I wrote a book uh, called The Big Disconnect, Protecting Childhood and Family Relationships in the Digital Age. I interviewed 500 teachers, 500 parents, 1,000 children between the ages of 4 and 18 at 30 schools around the country. I interviewed an additional 25 little articulate three, two, three, and four-year-olds and 250 young adults between the ages of 18 and 30. I had enough information to write four books. I wrote one book. I didn't want to be an alarmist, but I am very alarmed and concerned about the way we are in denial about the impact of technology on child development, uh, neurologically, psychologically, socially, physically, and also the way in which we are not doing a good enough job educating ourselves, one another, and the right to know what in fact we already know about the psychological, neurological, and physical fallout of technology. So it's one thing for us as grown-ups to laugh, to talk, to make jokes, to <coughs> accuse each other of being so addicted to your smartphone. It's a very different thing when we hand a smartphone or a tablet to an infant, to a four-year-old, to a six-year-old, to a ten-year-old, at every transition in their lives, in their day, from the moment they're up, in the car ride, on the way to school, a frustrating long line at Whole Foods checkout in a, on the airplane. It has become a norm to give a child the very device to which we say we are addicted. And this has created a huge impact on children's development. The American Pediatric Association says under no certain terms should a child under the age of two ever be in front of any screen. And yet 38% of kids 0 to 2 are in front of screens and being handed smartphones to play with. And furthermore, what we are seeing is that when you give an infant a smartphone, an iPhone, a tablet, it works brilliantly. They are quiet. They are happy. They are content. They love Talking Tomcat, the most favorite app. But the problem with this is that what you are doing is you are giving children a stimulant. And a stimulant is something the human brain loves and comes to crave. The very first challenge we have when we have an infant, and this remains a challenge all the way through young adulthood, is teaching a baby how to soothe itself, how to calm down. We coo, we hold them, we rock, we say, 
Oh, I know this is hard. Let's play I spy with my little eye. We become that internalized voice in their head that by five teaches them how to be calm, how to share, how to wait, how to take their turn in school. What we are seeing in today's children when they come to kindergarten, first, second grade, in my research with teachers, not only at 30 schools in America, but now around the world, what I hear is a description everywhere I go of the same deficits. And these are what they are, the capacity to self-soothe, to calm down. Language development, highly intelligent parents are having children enter school with a language deficit that has not been seen in this population before because they think that listening or reading or hearing a book on tape creates language. It does not. The best way the human brain learns language, it's highly relational. It's being read to in real life by a person who cares for you. The brain does not light up. All language centers of the brain will not light up when you are hearing a book on tape. We see a deficit in children's capacity for frustration. They want the teacher to help them get to the next level, whatever it is, much faster. Are there any teachers in the room here? Anybody for whom this sounds familiar? So what teachers say is often kids come to me, they won't try a second time, a third time, because they are so used to the instant gratification of putting a button, getting to the next level. And furthermore, every little accomplishment you make on any computer game comes with pings and whistles and butterflies and sparkles. And kids say their teachers are boring because they don't light up and explode. <laughs> and teachers actually say, we feel like we have to be edutainment to keep these kids' attention because they are so used to the neurological hit, the happy high, the way your brain feels, which is a neurological stimulant when you are playing a computer game. So what we are seeing in children for whom the magic of the iPad has replaced the magic of outdoors is not only a deficit in their capacity to sit still, to learn, to uh, tolerate frustration, but a decline in their capacity to do what we call deep play. And that's the ability to play outside, to play under the rhododendrons and make up a story in your own head. And you come to that quiet pause place and then you go deeper and deeper and deeper in the language of gaming. You get to the next level through your own curiosity. And what children are showing an inability for is the capacity to stay connected to their self, their creativity inside of them to play on their own. And this is very serious. And the last thing that we are seeing in children is we have seen a very big spike in referrals in five, six, seven-year-olds for OT, occupational therapy, because it is in playing outside that you develop kinesthetically your coordination. You develop the capacity to use your whole hands to move in your body. And when children are sitting on, on couches and just using their index fingers, we are seeing just even the most simple developmental delays in muscular of the hand, which of course isn't just about writing, it's about all sorts of neurological pathways. And we are seeing, of course, a correlation, which we believe also is probably causational with the increase in obesity in young children and kids of all ages because they are sitting on their couches playing games. And then what we also understand now from research is that when children are playing computer games and being given these games at such an early age, at every transition in, the, in their day, that their capacity also to connect to one another and their social emotional intelligence drops because the through lines in gaming are not the same values. The values in computer games are not the same values of yours. The most popular game for infants, infants, oh, to two years old, Talking Tomcat, there's a girl version too. It does three things. You say something to it, and it mimics you. The second thing it does is if you swipe it, it's a scratch on the screen. The third thing is if you tap your phone, you are punching a cat. So you have a game that toddlers love, that they're playing, that teaches them to tease by mimicry, normalizes scratching, and punching. So there are all sorts of ramifications of this. We're going to hear much more about the electromagnetic ones, resonance ones. But let me just say, in my travels around the world, I've been on the road for two years. I live just down the pike from you in Newton. One of the questions I get everywhere I go, from teachers, from parents, and every now and then from very smart, savvy, concerned students themselves, is the question, what does it mean neurologically? What is the fallout of all these hours we're spending on screens? Are we doing right by our children, having them be learning all throughout the day with their eyes gazing into a laptop. 
And what does it mean then when they go home from school and they're doing all their homework? Every book is downloaded. Yes, it's good for posture, but how about the rest of a child's neurological and social development? And we don't know yet enough about the implications of this, but until we do know, we have to pay attention to what we are seeing, and kids are spending far too much time on screens. Visually, neurologically, psychologically, we know there are very serious outcomes from this. And we have gotten to a point where we are in such denial about this. And the fact is that for teenagers beginning in middle school, kids today spend more time gazing into a screen on average 7 to 11 hours a day than any other activity in their life. Any other activity in their life. And the American Pediatric Association says very clearly, no screens whatsoever for children under the age of two. And let's limit it and keep it to the old good old Burton Ernie, Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, the so slow-paced, evidence-based research sh shows and games that we know are, in fact, educational for kids to watch. 38% of children under the age of two are on computers and smartphones. Many parents told me their baby's first word was my pwn, my pwn, because of course it's what they play with the most. And in a research out of uh, the UK, 30% uh, of children spent four hours a day Toddlers, four hours a day on screens. Now remember, this is at a developmental time in life where you are only awake. I'm, I'm sorry, they spent four hours a day on the screen and you are only awake for 10 hours in a given day. That's almost half of their day in front of a screen. And we are not listening to what we know and we're not asking enough questions about what is the impact. And furthermore, in Korea, if we look at what's happened in Asia and Korea and China and listen and learn from our Asian colleagues, they describe a situation where they now have treatment centers for five-year-olds who are truly psychologically addicted to computers. One in 10 children in Korea between the ages of 10 and 19 are diagnostically addicted to computers. They lead the world in having new recovery treatment therapeutic programs for children who are addicted to technology. And this has become the largest, most dangerous experiment on the developing child brain without an ethical review board. And this is very serious. We have a situation now where one out of seven set of parents here and in the UK allow their infants and toddlers, babies, up to four hours a day on the screen. Why aren't we listening? Why aren't we paying attention to what research we already know? What can we do to make sure people and parents have the information they need, the right to know? There's far more research coming out of other parts of the world than the US. We need to listen to it. We need to pay attention to it. We need to educate ourselves. We need to ask for research money to be designated and given to this area. And most of all, we have to work together to come out of denial about the ramifications of this kind of exposure for the developing child brain. Thank you.